It's all so complex and complicated. It feels so ominous. Horsemen? Seals? The mark? How did the early church understand it all, anyways? I don't know what to focus on or watch for. It feels like everything could be a sign, especially these days. Are we living in the end times right now? Is it about the future? Or maybe it's already happened and I missed it. What's God trying to show us? How do we know what's real and what's made up by Hollywood? Here's what I do know. I know that Jesus is faithful. His plan and God's timing are perfect. And I know what matters most is that, in the end, He wins. Jesus wins. Recently, I was listening to my husband and my son playing together. Both of them have this incredible ability to add to their storyline such amazing details. And they take their characters on these fantastical adventures. When it's my turn to play with my son, I can't seem to match the imagination of my husband. Now he'd probably jokingly say it's because I'm older than he is. But I'd simply say it's because in my line of work, I listen to many real, usually painful stories. I just find it difficult to think beyond what is in the natural world. What about you? How easy is it for you to get those imagination brain cells active? Eugene Peterson commented, it is impossible to read the book of Revelation and not have your imagination aroused. There are many people who stubbornly refuse to read the last book of the Bible, probably because it isn't the type of material that you can read and just rapidly skim the key headings. It requires more than that. Peterson described Revelation as a gift, a work of intense imagination that pulls its reader into a world of sky battles between angels and beasts, lurid punishments and glorious salvation, a kaleidoscopic vision and cosmic song. It's a world in which children are instinctively at home and in which adults may become like little children. This fall, you've heard the book of Revelation is a drama. H have you been thinking of it as such? Now, so far we've covered act one. That's the first three chapters of Revelation. And we've been working our way through act two. Today, we're nearing the end of the second act as we turn to Revelation chapter 10. Last week, Pastor John, he explained that the angels sounding their warning trumpets are about the terrible reality of judgment. And in God's divine plan, he invites us to participate by being people who pray. Remember how clearly it was emphasized last Sunday that there is power in prayer. Heaven becomes silent just to hear the prayers of Christians. And what breaks the silence is when God speaks. The voice of God is like thunder. Psalm 29, verses 3 to 5, describe it this way. The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. So there is power when God speaks. To recap, our incense prayers are powerful. The words of the Almighty God are trumpet sounding and they are powerful. Is there really anything more that's needed for God to make himself known? I have friends and family who do not know the truths declared in God's word, so my responsibility is to pray. And God speaks through his spirit. He can be heard through the words of scripture, through preachers, through visions and promptings that could come into one's mind? Are we expected to do anything else? 
What do you think of when I say the word evangelism? Some people simply don't like the word. Is it better if I call it witnessing? Maybe not. It still feels uncomfortable, right? Barna released a study within the last couple of years that states almost half of the practicing Christians living in the states who are under the age of 24, they agree, at least somewhat, that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that they will one day share the same faith. And 20% of boomers and elders, they share that same opinion. Should evangelism be a high priority? If we can pray and God gave us this word, do we really need to tell others what we believe? There are people with an evangelism gifting. It's their job, right? Is there any significance really to the times when we stutter about God's work in our daily conversation with people who would rather almost be listening to anything else? Our world is brash, it's noisy, and it's assertive. And what can an ordinary Christian say that can stand a chance against cynical advertisements, faithless artists, indulgent entertainers who are regularly conditioning us to a vo devotion to me and to the now? What would it take for your imagination to be renewed so that you could gain confidence, so that you could honestly and personally be able to say who God is and what eternity means? Maybe the Apostle John recognized this dilemma when he wrote Revelation. Again, it was Eugene Peterson who wrote, we're not reading Revelation to get additional information about the life and the faith of Christ. Well, that can be found in the previous 65 books of the Bible. The truth of the gospel is already complete. It's revealed in Jesus Christ. There is nothing new to say, but there is a new way to say it. When we read Revelation, it's to be read in a way that revives our imagination. The Revelation was written to be read out loud in public worship because the images need to be heard in order to be seen. Last week, we heard about the sixth trumpet sound. Revelation 10 and 11 is an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So this is a moment for us to breathe before we hear what is to come in the final trumpet. Chapter 10 tells us one vision that was given to John, and chapter 11, a second vision. Now, I'm only talking about chapter 10. And so that means when we pick this series up in the new year, you are going to want to be right back in your seats, right where you are, ready for more. The vision in chapter 10 is a message to all of the church. This message is relevant for today because right now we are living in between the six and the seventh trumpet. So try to imagine as I read and tell the story of the vision in Revelation chapter 10. Close your eyes if it helps. Now the Apostle John, he was back on earth. See, previously he had been invited to enter into the heavenly realms and that's where these visions were unfolding before him. But now he's returned down to earth and we know this because he writes, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. John is now looking up and he notices, he notices that there's this angel, a mighty angel. It's one that is different from the angels that had sounded the trumpets. See, in scripture, angels sometimes were mistaken as men as they walked and they talked with people but it's always different when they're mentioned in visions. They're cosmic, they're larger than life. In Revelation 10, the angel is described as mighty, strong, powerful, and it was clothed or it was wrapped in a cloud. Simply this emphasizes the heavenly stature. A rainbow was on or above its head 
So picture it like a brilliant crown of color, possibly representing hope, and his face radiated like the sun. Again, emphasizing this angel has been in the presence of God. Like Moses, when he came back down Mount Sinai, after being in God's presence, his face shone like the sun. The angel's feet, or his legs, they were like pillars of fire. And in the book of Exodus, you may recall, God's presence showed up as a pillar of fire at night, and it gave both protection and guidance to the children of Israel while they were in their wilderness journey. So even though some of these phrases may sound like they're describing deity, this angel is not Jesus Christ. It is a created angelic being. Look at verse 2. His right foot was on the sea, his left foot on the shore. Now, if you're simply picturing this angel standing at a seashore, just where the waves are coming into the land, you've got to think bigger. No, this, this colossal sent messenger, he plants his foot straddling the sea and the other over the land. Have you got the visual impact of this enormous angel that descended from heaven? And then the angel gives a loud cry. It's roaring like a lion. I remember as a kid when my dad, who used to sing bass in a gospel quartet, so he had this low, deep voice. And when he would let out a booming yell, whenever I was doing something that I shouldn't have been, he had my entire attention. I didn't dare move. Now, as if just seeing the image of this giant angel doesn't demand attention, the angel then shouts. So there's no way John's mind is wandering. So don't let yours pay attention to what happens next. This sent messenger has a mission. And when he calls out, the seven thunders call back. Seven is perfection. The one responding to the angel's cry, to the angel's roar, is this thunderous voice of the almighty God. And he spoke words, but I have no idea what they were. See, John does. Revelation 10 verse 4, it says, When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Keep secret what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. John, he was forbidden to disclose the content of the seven thunders. It was not to be made known to the churches. Now, some have argued that the thunders remain mysterious as a literary technique. It builds suspense. And what they had said will be revealed at the end of time, when God's mystery is finished. But more importantly, the seven thunders, they remain mysterious in order to teach that there are hidden things that belong to God. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow all the words of the law. God knows far more about the future than what he tells us. And I submit to you, he reveals to us what is essential for us to know. Now, even in the Garden of Eden, at the very beginning of time, there was knowledge that was just not helpful for Adam and Eve to know. And they were forbidden to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But their disobedience is what led to the fall of humanity. It led to the separation, the brokenness in the relationship that we have with God. What I do know is that when God reveals something to us, it's for our good. And when he withholds something from us, it's also for our good. We need to trust God on this. We can also learn from his example, and we can apply it to what we know about witnessing to others. So the first thing that we can learn in witnessing is 
not to tell everything. You probably know that Alpha is the main evangelism tool that we use at Sanctus. And when people want to run an Alpha group for their friends and their family, we guide them through this training that helps teach them that they are not to answer every question that their unbelieving friend asks, but rather we teach them to explore what they believe, to explore what does God say, and to explore who he is. It's not that the answers need to remain secret, or, but what we do need to do is to be wise, to know what is the unbelieving world capable of handling at that moment. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and they had the opportunity to witness his transfiguration, he instructed them, tell no one of this vision. And there are numerous instances in which Jesus, he forbids people who had just been healed to go and to tell others about it. He was actually training us in the skill of witnessing. There is a time to keep silent and there is a time to speak. Ecclesiastes 3.7. Okay, let's keep working through the chapter. Are you still visualizing that massive angel? Look at verse 5. Then I, or then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land, he raised his right hand toward heaven. He swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. He said, there will be no more delay. When the seventh angel blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, his prophets. The angel's words, there will be no more delay. That can be translated, there will be no more time. I find these words encouraging. Remember in chapter 6 about the seals and the persecution that Christians will face. See, this is announcing the time when that part ends and the forces of God and Satan are going to meet in final confrontation. The end of history, as was the beginning, is all under the sovereign control of God. That's the fulfillment of God's mysterious plan. What is God's mysterious plan? Well, Paul answered that when he wrote Colossians 2 verse 2. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. So then God's victory has already taken place. In heaven, through the triumph of Jesus' messianic mission here on earth, God's divine plan for the salvation of humanity, the gospel message is simply this. God created us for his glory. And we are supposed to live our lives to bring him glory. But because of our sinfulness, we fall short of his glory. The punishment that we deserve is death. But instead, Jesus Christ, he willingly gave himself as a sin offering and he took our place. He was the lamb who was willing to bleed for the purpose of restoring our relationship to God. And all we have to do is to believe and to trust in Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. And then in return, we receive the free gift of eternal life with God. Now, does that message bring you hope today? Why? Why then is it so difficult for us to share it? Look again to the vision at verse 8. It says, then the voice from heaven spoke to me again, go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, it said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it and it was sweet in my mouth. But when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. 
Do you see how the voice from heaven told John to go and get the scroll from the angel? God, who is infinitely greater than even this mighty angel, is still the one in control. John would have been reluctant to just approach this great, glorious angel without having been given some specific instruction from the one who is even greater. And God, he rules all superhuman, all supernatural forces. This now, this is when John becomes involved in the action that's taken place. And he's not passively observing anymore. The scroll is smaller than the one that we read about in chapter four, and it's already opened. Now, unlike that great scroll, the one that had been sealed, the great scroll scroll that contained the purposes of God in so far as what was to be achieved by the lamb, the little scroll, it contains a new version of those same purposes, but in so far as what is to be achieved through the agency of us, the church. So God's job was bigger as part of his plan. Our part as the church, it fits in a booklet-sized scroll. There's a similar story to all of this in the Old Testament. The prophet Ezekiel, he's like John, he's in exile and he has a vision and he was also commissioned to eat a scroll. Eating a scroll sounds bizarre, but use your imagination. The prophets are given a scroll that consists of divine revelation. So why be told to eat it? Well, God's expectation is not that they kiss it, not they give it a little lip service. No, figuratively, they have to digest it. So before they can communicate it to others, the content must be taken in and it's gotta become a part of their life. Well, we can learn from this also on how to witness. Witnesses first become what they then say. God's word, it must be internalized. If you come to church on a Sunday, quite likely you can hear a sermon and leave unchanged. But if you engage with the passage and if you study it with others, it can become transformational. And that's why most of our connect groups, they meet regularly to discuss the sermon series. For both Ezekiel and John, the scroll tasted sweet as honey. And the difference for the prophets, however, is that John found it bitter once it reached his stomach. Why? The scroll's message was good news for the church. It was about salvation. So what made John's stomach churn? Maybe, maybe it's the same things that make your stomach queasy when you speak about the good news. The fear of rejection. How many times have you invited someone to Alpha only for them to turn you down? How many more times can you go through that? How many times have you lost friends or been made fun of for what you believe? I once read, a witness may be a hero to other Christians, but in the world, the witness is alone, suspect, ignored, and occasionally abused. Another thing that makes my stomach churn is the concept of God's wrath. Earlier this fall, I read through the book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel. And I found them to be a tough read as God describes the punishment for his enemies. We ought to feel sick also about the fact that there are people who are alive today and they've never heard of Jesus and they are positionally owned by God's enemy. And if that doesn't cause you to feel something in your gut, do you really believe what this word says? The current state of the church, that might also make us feel sick. I mean, God is victorious, but the full measure of his kingdom has not yet been realized on this earth. There is ambiguity. It results from living in the last days. See, sin and death are defeated, 
but they're still experienced. Life and holiness are real, but they're hard possibilities. Well, John also may have found this message hard to swallow because he was writing earlier in Revelation 1 through to 3. He's writing these warnings to the churches. And maybe his bitter response was to those congregations that have just fallen from their earlier spiritual vitality. And plus, he wrote chapters 7 and 8 about how before the final triumph, believers are going to pass through fierce satanic opposition. And no matter how the scroll's message made John feel, he was given a job to do, and he responds without hesitation. He's in his 90s, and he's on an island, and he's given no time to sit and think about retirement. Revelation 10, verse 11 says, Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. John is charged with, you must prophesy again. Ezekiel was to deliver a message to the house of Israel. John was to prophesy or to preach to many peoples, many nations, many languages. This reminds us God's salvation plan is global. It's for all people. As it says, Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The classification of peoples, nations, and languages, and tribes, it occurs five times in Revelation. But here in our text, the word tribes is actually replaced with kings. It's perhaps to suggest that God's word, it takes precedence over even the highest rank of human authority. The vision that John received in Revelation 10, it was to prepare him to be a witness and to clarify, just so that there is no question in your mind today, we have also received the exact same assignment. Jesus said it in Matthew 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. To witness is not an option. You too, you must eat the little scroll. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, So we are Christ's ambassadors, and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, Come back to God. The gospel is awesome. And it's mysterious. We have been presented with the complete meaning of the divine life, but sometimes our minds just boggle at its immensity. You may not understand it all. You might feel like your words get lost in translation, but we're not speechless. And if we rely on the Holy Spirit, he will guide us. There is something after all that can be said and we are to say it. You know, that same Barna study that I mentioned earlier, it also stated that 47% of Gen Z Christians think that the most important thing is their actions need to consistently represent their faith rather than a focus on words at all. Well, did you know that half of the non-Christians that were interviewed said they have no preference whether or not someone shares their faith verbally. Thinking that we have to be sensitive to this actions speak louder than words type of evangelism, that's false. It doesn't matter to the people who are hearing the gospel, so why is it a big deal to you? However well we speak, We've got to know it's always going to be just an abbreviated version of the fullness of the fact that the word became flesh. So our inadequacy, it does not incapacitate us. Just because we can't say it all does not mean that we are exempt from saying anything. 1 Peter 3.15 is my life verse. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the reason, for the hope 
that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. In these last days, God is at work. His judgment is evident in the world around us. Your friends and your family, they need you to help them process what they're seeing. They need to hear your story of God's redemptive work in your life, why you live to bring him glory, and why you have hope, because in the end, he wins. Daryl Johnson wrote this, the trumpets alone do not bring about repentance. The trumpets alone can actually bring about great confusion or despair or greater hardening toward God. What enables the trumpets to bring about repentance is prophecy or preaching, just speaking. What brings about repentance is being told that the judgments are a warning and they're designed to bring us back to God. Chapter 10, it shows us the role of the church. As judgment is being worked out on the stage of history, we are to declare truth in the midst of all that is happening. Our response to Revelations 8 through to chapter 11, it is to declare what the Lord has said in the circles where we live and where we work. We need to look for the opportunities that God has set before you. If a door closes, just look for the next one that's open. A few years ago, around this time of year, my daughter's teacher sent a message home to all the parents and all the guardians, inviting us to come into the classroom and to share with the class about our annual traditions. Well, I replied immediately. I was realizing this was an opportunity to talk about how annually at Christmas time, our family celebrates the birthday of Jesus Christ with balloons, with cupcakes, and with a party for him. So the date was planned for me to come, but then it got postponed. Administration had found out that uh, the only parent who had responded to the invitation to talk about annual traditions was a Christian pastor. This concerned them. And a notice went home to every family informing them that if they wanted to, they could remove their child from my presentation. The principal set up a phone call with me. She wanted to know specifically that it was not my intent to proselytize. I agreed. I was not going to recruit or convert a student to Christianity. And I'm humble enough to know that what God does in someone's heart or in their mind is not in my control. Well, the teacher followed up explaining that I must focus on the annual traditional tradition part. And as long as I could prove that our festivities happened year after year, then a new presentation date could be set. So no problem, I said. I have photos from every year. Now take note, I couldn't share everything about God's plan for salvation in that one presentation. I got some of my friends to, to pray some of those powerful incense prayers. And well, God just, he does what he does. I arrived at the school with my photos and a rather large nativity set and a bunch of birthday supplies, only to be informed that multiple teachers had decided to participate and that I would be speaking to a number of primary classes. And they were actually going to give me the entire afternoon. This is the kind of opportunity that only God can be given the glory for. Now, some of those kids probably left thinking, okay, the best part of that family's tradition is eating cupcakes covered in candy for breakfast on Christmas morning. But I must also assume that some of them left having heard in a classroom in a public school system, no less, likely for the first time in their lives, the history of how Jesus Christ is the true reason we celebrate big at Christmas time. As Christ's ambassadors, telling others about him is not an option. It is expected. And if it's been a while since you've talked about your Lord to those who don't know him, 
then this series on Revelation is exactly what you've needed. We all need a hearty infusion of imaginative cells into our circulatory system of our faith every once in a while, don't we? You know, if ordinary daily Christian conversation is not going to become some kind of platitudes or these cliches, it really needs to be in touch with the rich, the vibrant reality of the supernatural, the invisible vitalities of our God. What happens when a person following the Lord obeys this command to tell others? Let me remind you what Ezekiel had the incredible privilege of seeing. In Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 10, I'll I'll read from the message. God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up, set me down in the middle of an open valley with bones. He led me around, and among them, a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones, bleached by the sun. And he said to me, son of Man, can these bones live? I said, Master, God, only you know that. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. God, the master, told the dry bones, watch this. I'm beginning the breath. I'm bringing the breath of life to you and you'll come to life. I'll attach sinews to you, put meat on your bones, cover you with skin and breathe life into you. You'll come alive and you'll realize that I am God. I prophesied just as I had been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound and oh, wrestling. The bones moved, came together bone to bone. I kept watching, sinews formed, then muscles on the bones, then skin stretched over them, but they had no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, tell the breath. God the master says, come from the four winds. Come, breath. Breathe on these slain bodies. Breathe life. So I prophesied just as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came alive. They stood up on their feet, a huge army. I can only imagine. Oh, I hope that this image is in your mind as you think about what's happening in the supernatural realm. If only you would speak the good news of the gospel. So your job is to speak. It's God who brings about new life. This is what I hope you take away with you today. Some matters are not ours to know. you got to trust God with what you don't know. The word must be taken in deeply, digested even, to be authentic and lived out so that you can share it. Let's follow John's example. Obeying even when the message does not make sense or it feels bitter or it's hard to swallow. As Christ's ambassador, speaking about him is not an option. And our goal is not to recruit, not to force people. We must never mislead others. We must simply bring light about eternity and then just offer an invitation to those who have not yet heard. Finally, the gospel is for all people, all nations and languages. And our job is not done until all have heard. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, thank you for this book of Revelation. This book that stirs our imagination and it just helps us to see beyond ourselves to the supernatural reality of who you are and how you are at work. Now, I believe, God, that you could reveal yourself and your salvation plan without us, but you've chosen for us to be your ambassadors. So may we, this Christmas season, be ignited by your spirit with boldness and gentleness and respect 
the, to eat the little scroll and to do our part as the church, declaring your message to your created people to come back to you, to come back to God. And would you then, Lord God, would you bring new life where the dry bones once sat? So in your beloved son's name, in Jesus Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen.